Welcome to the Gambang Fet Historical Park. I believe this is the forest district because the park has kind of three sections. It has this district, I've, I've seen it called the forest district. It's a couple of kilometers outside of town. There's another section of the park right downtown in the city. And then there's a third section, a more open area across the river in a different town altogether. But I thought I'd start my uh, visit to the historical park with the main section. I believe this is considered the main uh, part of the uh, historical park. It costs 100 baht for a ticket to go here, or you could pay 150, and that would give you entrance to the forest section and the downtown section. But I don't plan on going there today, so I just got the one ticket for uh, here. And they gave me a nice, um, which I really appreciate, a nice map of uh, this section of the historical park and the one that is downtown. So that'll be very uh, handy to refer to as I uh, walk or ride around this park. And um, she also gave me a brochure all about the park. I'm gonna sit down in a minute and read through that before I go inside add to my store of knowledge of course the usual safety procedures are in place here where they had they took my temperature at the entrance and there was a lot of sanitizing going on sanitizing the money that i handed her sanitizing the ticket that she handed to me uh sanitizing everything my hands her hands but there was no request for a vaccine certificate. I didn't have to present my passport or anything like that. I have my mind fixated on three particular temples that I want to visit. And if I only see those three temples today and the visitor center, I will figure, I'll consider that to be a good day. And I won't worry that I haven't seen everything there is to see because I can always come back tomorrow. And as I mentioned in a previous video, this park, this historical park is actually part of the same UNESCO World Heritage site. It's kind of a grouping of three places, I believe, Sukhothai, Kambang Fet, and then one other place I forget the name of. And the visitor center, which I hope is open. So far, yeah, I really like this uh, visitor center. I'm pleased because it is uh, deeply air-conditioned and it's full of cats, so uh, you can't argue with that. And there is a, a scale model of the park right here in the middle, which looks interesting. Not labeled though, so I'm not... Okay, that... Um, oh, okay, so here you can actually see what I was talking about, the different sections of the park where this trapezoidal shape next to the river that is the kind of the downtown district and that's encircled by a wall i believe the city wall and fortifications so that is the inner district where we are now is this more oval shaped forested section out there and that is the uh, yeah the forested district and that red flag that you see is actually the main entrance and the third district is over here, across this bridge, across the Ping River. There's another city here. Um, I've forgotten the name. But there are a lot of ruins, particularly down in this area. But they aren't enclosed inside a park at all. They're just out as part of the city. So you can just sort of see them everywhere as you wander around. So I'm chatting with someone from the uh, visitor center here at the historical park and he agreed to answer a couple of simple questions for me. Uh, what is your name, by the way? My name is Tanagon Manikun. Tanagon? Yes. Okay, I'm Douglas. Nice. 
Yes, me too. How long have you worked here? Uh, about five years. Five years? Yeah. Okay. So are you now kind of an expert in the history of <laughs> Sukhothai? Uh, uh, yes, I, I, think, I think so. A little bit. Yeah. So I'm, I was wondering if you could tell me, like we're here in this district, like down, down here. What is it called, this part of the historical uh, park? What is the name? It's part called uh, outside, outside part of Gampeng Pei. The outside yeah. part. Uh, in Thai name, we call Aranyik. Oh, Aranyik. Aranyik area. It means uh, forest area. Oh, OK. I saw that on the internet. Aranyik means the forest area. Yeah. And what do you think is the most interesting uh, temple to visit? Okay, I recommend you to visit uh, Wat Chang Rok. Wat Chang Rok? Yeah, Wat Chang Rok. And uh, Wat Pra Si Iriya Bot. Okay. Uh -huh. And Wat Pra Non. Wat Pra Non. Yeah. Yeah, I think I remember those names. I was doing some reading. And Wat Chang Rok. That is about elephants, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, this temple has uh, 68 elephants surrounded by uh, JD. Okay. Yes. And I believe this one is about the number four, right? Four, four. C, four, C, four, C, four C, what? Yeah. Uh, four posture Buddha, four Buddha posture in this temple. Oh, that's uh, right, like four positions for the Buddha. Yeah, yes. Uh, standing, reclining, sitting, and walking. Ah, okay. And the last one you mentioned, uh, what is special about that one? What Pranon is, uh, have, have a big, biggest, uh, biggest uh, pillar, biggest pillar. Uh, it's made from letter light. Okay. Uh -huh. and, uh, this, so, uh, this is about 15 tons. 15 tons yes. for the, the pillar? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Do any monks live here now? No. Only in, in history? Yes. Uh, no. Our, our temple is ancient site. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Just to follow up on what he said, he suggested that I start here at Wat Chang Rop, and that was where I was going to go, so that's good. And this is where they have 68 elephant sculptures made of stucco on a laterite core going around it. And then this one is Wat Pra Si Iria Bot. And C is the number four in Thai, and Iria Bot, I believe, means positions. So you, you find Buddha statues in four different positions, like sitting, walking, standing, and then reclining. And then Wat Pra Non is well known for having um, very large pillars supporting the structure. Oh, I guess you can see them there in the, in the photograph. Very wide and tall and uh, heavy pillars. So that's kind of my uh, plan for today. And then anything else I see will be a uh, bonus. And this is interesting. The next room is essentially a mini museum. So for me, it is like a review class for everything that I learned at the main uh, National Museum. And it looks like a lot of the information is organized along the same pattern. So I find that uh, very useful for me. So it looks like we're starting in, in terms of understanding the history, they start with the prehistory, the new stone age, between 4,000 and 6,000 years ago. So all of these artifacts were found in and around uh, this area. And then it moves on to prehistory during the Metal Age. And they uncovered some of these metal tools. And they have a couple of uh, samples down here. 
And from there, we move on to sort of a new word for me, the Dharavati civilization. And I did a bit more reading about this. And this civilization pretty much covered the same geographical area as Thailand today. And it was so long ago in the past and not much is known about it, but there are artifacts from that period and a lot of art and uh, they have some ideas about the culture. And in terms of the timing, from the seventh to the 11th centuries AD, um, that's how long the uh, Dvaravati civilization endured. I was just reading through this description of the uh, Dharavati civilization, and I've got a f I remember now a few key facts about this civilization that you can remember to keep this straight in your head, that this was founded by the Mon people, which I didn't know, and it's signified by a shift from more of a hunter-gatherer way of life before this, and in the Dharavati, Dharavati civilization, this is when people started to settle down in communities and develop agriculture and build large towns and have more of a settled agricultural life. Previous to this, it was more of a hunter-gatherer way of life for the people in this uh, part of the world. So there you go, that's how you remember. And a lot of their culture appears to be based on the culture of India though I don't really know what the connection is between India and here, but a lot of the civilizations you read about in Southeast Asia, they almost always lead back to something in India. Um, yeah, it's just, it has such a powerful influence on uh, this entire part of the world. And I believe after the Dharavati civilization came the Lopburi kingdom, and then the Lopburi kingdom kind of merged into Sukhothai, and then Sukhothai was absorbed into Ayutthaya. So there you go. <laughs> Taravati, Lotburi, Sukhothai, Ayutthaya. Though it, it can get a bit confusing, I found, because the names for all these kingdoms and the historical periods change quite a bit when they go from Thai into English. So different sources use different uh, names for a lot of these things. So you have to uh, apply your brain a little bit to keep it all straight. I was just reading this page and I noticed that they listed a lot of these different eras, starting with the prehistoric era, Dharavati, Sukhothai, Ayutthaya, leading into the Ratanakosin period. And I've seen this one, I believe, also referred to as the Bangkok period. So I was confused about that for a long time. And I noticed that they don't have Lopburi listed at all in here. And uh, when you investigate Lopburi, it does get confusing because I think they also call it Lavo. So it's actually the Lavo Kingdom. And Lopburi was the like, capital city. But those two words, Lopburi and Lavo, seem to be used interchangeably. But they don't mention it at all in here. But I think it, that occurred here between these two but I could be wrong about that. Well, I enjoyed that very much. I was a bit surprised how heavily the visitor center focused on the prehistoric eras. That whole display was pretty much dedicated to that. And it stopped at the Dvaravati era and didn't actually go on to talk about uh, Sukhothai and Ayutthaya, Ayutthaya, which is what this area is known for. So that's kind of interesting. But I did find out a very important piece of information that I'm allowed to just ride my scooter anywhere uh, in the park. So that's, uh, yeah, that's great news. I guess I'll be hopping on and off the scooter uh, quite a bit. All right, let's uh, head towards the Wat Chang Rup. Wat Chang Rup. And you can remember that because of a uh, Chang beer, Chang beer, which of course has an elephant on the label. So <laughs> Wat Chang Rop tells you that there are elephants at this uh, temple. Oh, I'm so excited. There it is just ahead. And uh, you can make out the 68 elephants around it. 
And there's a secret to this temple that I'll talk about in a minute once, uh, once I get there. Wow. Can you get a nicer environment than this? I ask you, really? Look how beautifully it's landscaped clean and organized and so spacious. Look at this place. I am so impressed. Over there, there's another set of public toilets. Look very uh, clean and, and new as well. So you don't even have to uh, worry about it that much going to the bathroom at the visitor center because they have uh, bathrooms right here at the uh, Wat Chang Rop. And as always, I'm going to go check out the information signs before I approach the uh, temple itself. I'm also very impressed with the information that is on display, particularly in uh, English. Oh, and there's more QR codes there, where apparently these will take you to websites in your language of choice. Thai, English, Japanese, Chinese, or French. So that's very cool. So, Wat Changrop reconstructed. I wonder how much of it was... Uh, oh, I guess it hasn't been reconstructed. I think this... They're saying that this diagram, this drawing, is a reconstruction of how it would have looked, including, you know, a complete Chedi, the main monument, because, as you can see, in the, uh, in, as it is now, the Chedi has collapsed. It's no longer there. So we've got the Chedi with elephant caryatids. I don't know what that is. The monastery. So I guess this long structure at the front, that would have been the monastery. Number three, where's number three? A consecration hall. Oh, it's over here, down on the left. And I guess, oh, that would be it uh, right over there, the uh, Consecration Hall. Subsidiary monuments at corners, on the four corners. Subsidiary monuments and pond. Now, I've been reading about these ponds where I'm told, or I read that a lot of these um, temples have a pond right in front of it. And the ponds were formed because this is where they dug up the laterite that they used to build the temple. So they found laterite in the ground here, dug it up and built the temple right beside it. All very convenient. And there's another uh, three-dimensional kind of view of how it would have looked originally. Hmm. And that's not even the main information board. That, it's uh, over here. Wat Chang Rab, aged around 14th to 16th century. This ancient site is at the highest point of this hill. The large principal chedi is a round bell shaped. The square is 31 meters wide at each side, with fully furnished lime sculptures of 68 elephants showing only their front half. One staircase, the sculptures of lions and guardians. Ah, there we are. A large laterite pond is found in front of the Vihara. It has been existed in this ancient for construction of this temple. So that's kind of what I was talking about. That they have these ponds, and that's where they got the laterite to build the uh, temple itself. Oh, I love the look of that one. Look at that. That is so cool. So this is the uh, consecration hall, and clearly there was there was a Buddha statue there. And oh, okay, I sort of came in this direction first because I wanted to see the laterite pond, and I think that's it. That's it over there. Man, useful stuff, this laterite. Look at that. They could use it in big slabs to make a, basically a fence, bricks to form kind of pillars. 
big bricks just to sort of make a foundation. And apparently all of this uh, laterite was dug out of this pit. Yeah, that makes, uh, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Huh, so convenient. Look at that view of the temple. Isn't that amazing? That is so cool. And they even built uh, laterite bases around these trees. And look how well landscaped this place is. That road out there, smooth new tarmac. There's a field out there that could be a golf course. Looks like a gorgeous green lawn where you play a polo or something. Wow. Here's an interesting close-up view of this laterite. And as I read the other day, it's supposed to be quite soft and malleable when it's in the ground. And then you pull it up in big lumps, big squares. And because it's so soft at that time, you can carve it into whatever shape you want. Probably not easily. It's still stone after all. But then once it's exposed to the air, it dries out and becomes hard, much harder stone like this. Something else here, something, some modern thing called AR Smart Heritage involving another uh, QR code. Hmm. I'm not much of a QR code guy for some reason. I just haven't incorporated them into my life. I guess maybe I have enough internet-based devices and information at my fingertips that taking it one step further and uh, scanning QR codes everywhere I go. It just seems like a, a step too far. <laughs> So this is interesting. I'm assuming this is original. So I guess the, the laterite was just the, the foundation and the original temple would not have looked like this at all. It would have been covered in this uh, thin coating uh, lime or, or whatever that's made out of. So what I find really beautiful about these temples is, of course, the exposed laterite. It just looks so interesting. But when it was completed, really, this just would have been the, the brick. Kind of like a house in Canada, you might have brick, but then they cover it up with a plaster or some other smooth surface. Yeah, let's climb up here and uh, get a closer look. Wow, that is so cool. I don't know, I wasn't expecting to be as affected by this as I am. But I just find this so interesting. Imagine how it would have looked originally if all of that laterite was covered in smooth plaster of some kind, perhaps even colorful. And all of the elephants were complete with uh, their trunks. It would have been quite a sight. And I love symmetry. And look how symmetrical this is as you come up on this base with the pillars on each side, looking straight down the center. Probably an equal number of elephants on each side. And then you've got the, uh, the chedi that would have been there in the middle. Would have been a very impressive sight. very front. Look at those elephants. Oh, wow. I wonder if a couple of them have been reconstructed to look exactly like they were maybe on the other side. I think I saw a, pho a photograph of some of these elephants that had been rebuilt. 
Yeah, it's interesting that it's only the uh, the front part of the uh, the elephant. Just the legs and uh, the chest and the head. Well, let's climb up th these stairs and we'll do it carefully as they recommend. I remember the stairs, the ones that I could climb at Angkor Wat were so steep. They actually built uh, railings and ropes and things like that to make it easier and safer because yeah, these are, um, these are quite, uh, quite dangerous to be honest. A lot of them have worn away to almost nothing. So there's almost nothing left of the uh, step anymore. And of course, when you're a doofus like me with a, a GoPro, you can easily get distracted by your camera, misplace a foot and uh, down you go. So I'm being very careful not to do that. Oh, I'm gonna stop here to take a look at some of these elephants, of course. That is so cool. that. So let's uh, go down a little bit and get a, uh, a look at the legs too. Yeah, again, because the, the core of the leg is a slab of rectangular uh, laterite. And then the outer plaster is really quite thick as you can see here very very thick layer where they've put on the outside to actually make an artistic you know representation of the leg of the elephant so the laterite itself is just roughly carved into shape and then all of the actual elephant leg is uh, done with this exterior coating Here's the very top, and this is where the, uh, the chedi would have been. And I've learned that you can identify a historical period or a cultural period based on um, the shape of the top of the chedi. And if it has a lotus bud shape, such as the one I saw the other day at uh, Wat Kolatai, that is true Sukhothai era. I think, but if it has more of a bell shape, like a standard, you can kind of see one over there on the top of that uh, smaller uh, structure there. If it's more of a bell shaped, that's kind of Ayutthaya. And I remember reading that Sukhothai is unique in terms of its representation of Buddhism because it blends the styles of many different periods and experts in the field, they can recognize exactly what they're looking at because they see the subtle variations between Sukhothai, um, Dharavati, and Ayutthaya, all these different eras kind of blend together in the uh, Sukhothai uh, era. So here's the, uh, the stairs. I've been joined by another group of uh, tourists. They uh, drove up in that car down there. And uh, there would be, yeah, the, the monastery. And according to the artist's representation, this would have had a roof over top of it. It would not have been open. So these pillars that you see around the edges would have supported some kind of a roof structure. And probably the same for the ordination hall over there. So at some point, I'm going to go down to the bottom again and uh, go all the way around uh, the edges to look at all 68 elephants. And uh, don't let me forget about the secret. There's still a secret about this temple that I mentioned at the beginning. And uh, I want to talk about that a little bit. It's a little bit like a, a treasure hunt. And we'll see how that goes. Man, I love the way these places are so open. They trust you that you're not going to stumble over the edges. You know, as you can tell, this is a very precipitous 
drop right here and uh, but there are no handrails, no barriers, no one yelling at you to uh, get away from the edge. <laughs> I, I kind of like that. At least for me, you know, I'm smart enough to know how far away to stay from the edge. But look how steep those stairs are. And it makes me wonder about that though, because even as they were building these, even those people back then must have thought to themselves, man, this is, this is too steep. And yet they still built them this way. And I wonder why, I mean, was the engineering such that they didn't know or they didn't have the capability to build stairs that slanted at a more, you know, accessible angle? Was that beyond the engineering of the time? I'm slowly working my way around the uh, top of this temple. It's all about the laterite. And I just started wondering about the, uh, the ground underneath me. I'm assuming that this whole thing is solid all the way down, that there's no rooms down below, no roof structure threatening to cave in. But I don't know that for sure, to be honest. And here at the top, you see some uh, bricks. So I guess, yeah, that would be an aesthetic choice that the main structure would be made with that rough hewn uh, laterite. And then when they get to the very top where the, they want the brick to be more exposed or then, or when they want the structure more exposed then they switch over to a kiln, like an, a traditional clay kiln fired brick, which would be much more, um, much more attractive and maybe easier to work with much sharper edges and easier to make uh, more polished designs. So ladder right at the bottom and then regular uh, brick up at the top. Yeah, and there's the, uh, look at that, it's still in place. The archway over the stairs. I didn't even notice that until just now. I wonder if it's been that way for all these hundreds of years or whether this was reconstructed. I don't think it, it doesn't look reconstructed to me. It does look uh, original. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, I'm surprised it's still standing, to be honest. Well, let's, uh, let's see what we can do in terms of working our way down the uh, stairs. Carefully. I found the proper vantage point to truly appreciate this temple. It's right here on this corner with the sun in exactly the right direction. Take a look at this. Isn't that amazing? I can't see it anymore on the screen of the pocket too. It's just way too small, but I can tell you that uh, standing here, it looks pretty impressive. But uh, yeah, 68 elephants. And the ones on this side seem to have a little bit more of their trunk left. The ones on the front are almost all fallen away. But um, there's a couple of guys here, like uh, just over from the corner. And you can see some, uh, some of their trunk is still left. And their legs. Yeah, look at that. Their legs are much more, uh, much more complete still on this side. Yeah, you wonder how much every year, every rainy season in Thailand takes away from these structures, you know, washes away a little bit more, a little bit more. Maybe to truly protect this place, they'd have to put a giant roof over top of the whole thing. Wow, look at that. And it is interesting to see these laterite skeletons, because that's really what they are. It's a laterite skeleton underneath all of the uh, material that they put on top to shape it. So these would have been guardian lions or guardian creatures of some kind. But you can see just how blocky and uh, you know very little form 
in those feet. But of course, they would have been much more elaborately carved and shaped in the original. But now everything's washed away. And uh, all you get is the, uh, the skeleton that remains. Okay, the secret to Wat Chang Rob is that in amongst the 68 elephants, there are supposed to be a scattering of smaller animals, sculptures of, I don't know, squirrels and bunny rabbits and dogs, or I don't know exactly what they, what they are, but they're supposed to be small animals hidden in the, in the um, carving here. Oh, look at that. I didn't even notice this until just now. In between the elephants over here, there's still a large part of the wall left. And there are carvings right in the wall there, like a beautiful sort of tree or a vine. I think it's a tree. And I didn't see that anywhere else because it's all been washed away. But parts of it remain here. I'll see if I can uh, get a close-up view of some of that. There, that's as close as I can get, but you should be able to see a little bit of the, the carving in between the, uh, in between the elephants. And I wonder if all the animals that they were talking about are supposed to be hidden within the leaves and branches of those trees. Because I don't see any, any way that little animal sculptures can be hidden here in the laterite bricks. So my idea was to uh, wander around here on the outside and look for these secret animals. I thought maybe once I started looking for them, they'd be very apparent, but I don't see anything at all. Oh, look at this, uh, this elephant at the corner. There's really not uh, much left of this poor guy at all. It's interesting that some of them have had the outer material washed away completely and others have a lot uh, left. wonder why that would be. Maybe there's just no reason at all for it. Still looking for these hidden animals. And if the, if the original intention was to hide these animals, they're doing a good job because I haven't seen any yet. So where all these squirrels are hiding in amongst the elephants, I don't know where they are. But I'm told they're here. Oh. Yeah, it's another nice perspective, the stairs leading up from the back. Just leaving from the elephant temple, Wat Chang, Wat Chang Rab. You can see it behind me there. And I am very tempted to just call it a day, head back into town and relax and just absorb this experience. But since I'm here, I am going to follow through on my original plan and quickly, or maybe, maybe not so quickly, we'll see, visit two more temples. And the next one is called Wat Pra Si Iriabat. Here are some typical signs from inside the park. And where I want to go is uh, 650 meters away. Wat Pra, pra Si Riabat. Ri Riabat. I think they got the spelling in English kind of screwed up there. And then maybe Wat Pranon after that. And those are my uh, the three temples that I wanted to visit today. As you can see, the road that goes through the park is in incredible condition. You are here on a bicycle, it'd be very easy to get around. You want to bring some water though, you need some drinking water while you're here. Oh, 
in a very short time, I've arrived at uh, my destination, Wat Pra Si Aryabhat, 14th to 16th century. Just reading through that, there is a great deal of uh, vocabulary specific to Buddhist architecture that uh, none of it I'm very familiar with. But the basic idea is what I talked about before. It says at the back of the base of the Vihara, it is the Mandapa, where the four body movements of the Buddha image, the standing, walking, sitting, and reclining. All right, I'm here. I'm off the uh, scooter. And there's the uh, temple behind me. Just from uh, glancing at it casually, I think it is among the better known temples here because of the four postures of the Buddha, but also because of its size. I mean, just looking at it, it is uh, quite a large complex. So I'm sure it's one of the larger ones here. The Wat Pra Si Aryabhat. Oh, this is the AR Smart Heritage. Oh, that is nice, actually. Those trees really set it off. Not to get too uh, pop culture-y, but this is very much like a, you know, Indiana Jones sort of set. Or, oh boy, I've already forgotten the name of the of that woman archaeologist adventurer. What was her name? Had a whole bunch of movies about her. And uh, they set one of her movies in Anchor Wat. Uh, it'll come to me. I had to Google it. Lara Croft, Tomb Raider. That's what this site uh, puts me in mind of with the trees growing in the middle of the, uh, the temple ruins. I continue to be astonished at the extent of this park and just how well cared for it is. I don't know anything about budgets and stuff like that, but I can't imagine that this park is cheap to maintain with all the facilities that they've built into it. And there seem to be a lot of staff busy uh, doing the landscaping as well. Oh, so it looks like there was a large seated Buddha image right here. Again, you can only see the base of it and a little bit of the laterite skeleton at the, at the base. And right here, okay. Oh, now, okay, now I'm getting the idea. I think this is the place where you see the four different postures. This would have been the standing Buddha. Somehow I thought it was in, in more complete condition than this. I must be thinking of a different temple, but there's the uh, standing Buddha. And I guess on this side would have been the seated Buddha. And continuing to move around in a clockwise direction. Savadhi, Savadikra. And on this side, oh, there's the more complete one. So I, okay, so I think the one on the front, that would have been the walking Buddha. And that's always my favorite Buddha image. It's too bad it isn't more complete. This is the standing Buddha. And look at that. That is impressive. That is a beautiful sight. And for me, all of this is heightened by the fact that it's in ruins. That kind of adds to the atmosphere more so than uh, taking away from it. And thinking as an engineer, I wonder how confident the experts are that this will remain standing like this. I mean, has, has there been analysis done that says it's okay as it is and that wall of laterite bricks doesn't need reinforcing, nothing is needed to preserve it in this condition? Or are we just sort of hoping? <laughs> I don't know. This sign has a bit more information about the four different images. 
it says that there are Buddha image in four different postures, a walking image in the east, a reclining image in the north. We haven't seen that one yet. A subduing, subduing Mara image, the sitting one in the south, which we just saw, and a dispelling fear image standing in the west. The dispelling fear image is in the best condition. So this is the dispelling fear image. I would have called it more of an image of forgiveness and compassion. That's what I get from that. Oh, that's probably because I read that. I'm not sure what I would think on my own if I just saw it. And over here, oh, look at that. This would have been the reclining image. Now, I was wondering how they would do that because all the other ones are sort of vertical in orientation, right? Even the sitting one, you could make it vertical, but the reclining would have been horizontal. So you need more of a wider at the base. But I'm assuming um, the image was just smaller and maybe they had some more decorations because that big space at the top would have been completely blank. So I wonder what was up there originally. And then this one would have been my favorite one, the uh, walking Buddha. I always, I always like to see those. But there isn't very much left of, uh, of the walking Buddha. Huh. I originally thought this was just the uh, standing Buddha. As I mentioned, when I first came up here, I find these temples are really set off nicely by the trees. Look at that giant tree right over here. And then if you turn around and look back towards the rest of the temple complex, you know, there's these beautiful trees everywhere. So the name, the forest district is very apt, as they say. Let's uh, climb up uh, here. Continue all the way around in our uh, clockwise uh, direction. Wow, beautiful spot. I'm very glad I actually decided to come here today. This is a nice uh, contrast with the uh, elephant temple. having a little bit of a dug thought here, because I just started wondering whether there was competition amongst the temple designers. These all would have been contemporary, right? Built roughly in the same time period. And if someone made the um, temple, the, the, the elephant temple, was it before or after this temple? And do they look at the other temples and they try to outdo each other in terms of elegance and uh, beauty or any other uh, factors, you know? Was there competition amongst the uh, temple architects and designers? The next temple for my visit today is the Wat Pra Non. And I'm a little bit confused about this temple because originally I think I thought it meant it had a really nice reclining Buddha, but everything I've read since then is all about the pillars. Maybe there's both. Maybe there are giant pillars and a beautiful reclining Buddha. First we have to find it though, that's uh... Oh. One thing I've learned today is that even with the forest here and the shade, I don't think you're going to be doing much walking around this park. It's just too... the distances are too great and it's simply too hot. I think it would be very challenging to try to walk through this park. You do enough walking when you visit the temple sites themselves. It took a while to stumble across number three, the Wat Pra Non, but here it is. Same time period, 14th to 16th century. Rectangular shape oriented to the east. There's a sala, a pool, a restroom. There's two parts to this temple, one area where the Buddha image is housed, 
and then the monk's living quarters. And there is the Vihara of the reclining Buddha, a round bell-shaped chedi, and a mandapa with a Buddha image situated. My last temple for the day, the Wat Pra Nan. Though I might go looking for one more if the reclining Buddha is not here. I, I don't know, there's something about that reclining Buddha that struck me as interesting because it had a reclining Buddha in the front and then two se seated Buddhas directly behind as if they were keeping the reclining Buddha company or something. It just, I don't know, there's something about the image that struck me. And I'm wondering whether that's here or at another uh, temple. So I'll have to do a bit of research if I don't find it here. So I guess the, uh, the feature about this temple, uh, the pillars, and there they are. Quite a dramatic set of pillars. And I assume there was a large roof sitting on top of these pillars. Why else would they be there? And uh, it's interesting that they still have a fairly well-preserved outer coating on top of the on top of the ladder. You can see where it's falling away here. You know, it's basically just a cement. That is a lot of pillars. <laughs> ah, and these ones are look to be shorter than those ones, unless unless they fell apart or something, but which kind of indicates to me the roof would have been sloping from here up to the higher ones. And that's why there are different heights, but I'm just uh, guessing. So what is going on here though? These are not laterite brick constructions. This is one giant piece of laterite. Oh, maybe that's what makes them special. You can see the join here where two pieces connect, but this whole bottom, this whole base is one solid going down into the ground quite a distance, I imagine. One single solid chunk of laterite. Ah, so maybe that's what makes these special here as well. You know, one big chunk, it's cracked open there at the bottom, but this is one single piece. And you can see the difference over here because this has a solid piece as the base. And then up above, then you see the laterite bricks piled on top. Ah, so I guess that's what makes these unique. Look at that. Yeah, those are big single pieces of laterite. And here's a, yeah, another one right here. It looks like I may have jumped the gun as far as lateralite, 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 lateralite pillars are concerned. Because here, <laughs> here is the granddaddy. This is where the big one is, or big ones. This is in the uh, Vihara. Okay, look at those. Oh, there's one right in front of me. One big chunk of lateralite from ground all the way up to the top. Monstrous or huge. Okay, now I get to see. Now I understand what makes uh, this so interesting as a temple or unique. It stands out from the other temples here. Now you start to wonder about some of the engineering, how this was carved out of the ground in a solid piece like that how it was transported, and then of course, how it was raised into position, and then how it was uh, given a firm foundation. There's a lot going on here, look at that. So many of them. Huh, very cool. And at the back of Wat Pra Non, is a very large chedi, still in very nice condition as well, has the bell-shaped section up at the top. 
Look at that, it's huge. I think this is by far the largest one that I've seen in the park. And we have some information about it over here. What do they have to say? The principal chetty is behind the vihara. The circular bell-shaped chetty rests on superimposed base with different shapes. The multi-receding octagonal tiered base, regarded as typical of Kambang Fet, supports a three-tiered structure in the form of overturned lotuses. Above the large bell-shaped body in the Sukhothai style is a square base shaped like a lotus. The top part, cone-shaped, is in ruins. King Chulalongkorn, that's the modernizing monarch, during his visit to the temple praised this chedi for its beautiful shape. So there you go. Very nice. Apparently, I'm not very familiar with lotuses because they keep talking about lotus-shaped this, lotus-shaped that, and it doesn't really mean a lot to me because I guess I don't know exactly how a lotus is shaped. So when they tell me it's shaped like a lotus, I'm like, okay, if that's what you're telling me, but um, I don't have anything to go by. Wow, that is a very uh, beautiful chedi. But the reclining Buddha that I was talking about is uh, not actually here. I think I just remembered why. The reclining Buddha is not here in the forest district. It's in the interior district. It's at a temple uh, near the National Museum. So that's, uh, that's where I will go tomorrow or the next day. We'll see uh, how much energy I have tomorrow to appreciate... Uh, more uh, temple ruins like these. I might uh, have a have an off day in between just to let this experience settle a little bit. Just relax in the town and then uh, return to the other district uh, the day after that. And all the giant pillars behind me at uh, Wat Pranon I think that marks the end of my visit to the, the forest district of the historical park, the Aranyak, the Aranyak district, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, to sum up, ah, I enjoyed this immensely. I'm so surprised at how much I enjoyed it. I just found it a very beautiful park, really interesting, well designed, well laid out, well cared for. Yeah, everything about it. All that's missing, to be honest, is a refreshment stand <laughs> where you can get an iced coffee, but, you know, those sorts of things don't seem to uh, creep into the parks and attractions here in Thailand that often, and maybe that's a good thing. There are a, an abundance of available coffee shops out there in the town of uh, Kambang Fet. And with that, I'll say goodbye for now, and I'll see you in the next video. And I'll certainly see you in the video where I go to visit the interior district, where there are some very interesting temples there to see, including, I believe, the reclining Buddha that I've been talking about and that I'm quite interested in seeing. And until then, yeah, I'll see you in the next video.